Hello, everyone. Welcome to another one of our Libraries Tasmania National Family History Month talks for August. And uh, also welcome to everyone who's joining us across perhaps Australia for our live webinar. Um, today we have the lovely Ros Escott and she is the coordinator for the Hobart branch of the Tasmanian Family History Society and a family historian with a diploma of family history. She's going to help us uh, unlock some mysteries today. Um, before we begin, um, just a little housekeeping if everyone can remember to turn off their phones. That's something that I actually forgot to, to mention in the last talk. And um, also I'd like to uh, offer and express uh, a welcome to country on behalf of Libraries Tasmania. Uh, so Libraries Tasmania recognises the deep histories and cultures of the Aboriginal people of Lutrawita, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past, present, and emerging who hold the memories, traditions, culture and knowledge of country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. I'd like to welcome Ros. Thank you, thank you. Actually, I'm not the coordinator of the Family History Society, I'm the coordinator of the DNA interest group. I'm actually the vice president of the Hobart branch, but that's, that's a a minor role. Um, and I, I just perhaps start out by mentioning that the um, the DNA interest group, which has been running for about five to six years, I think, and we grew too big for the um, to meet in the Bell Reef Library. So it now meets on the third Thursday of the month. Um, and this is on the website. If you go to the Family History Society Hobart branch website under resources. It, there's information there. It's the third Thursday of the month, 1.30 to 3, and we meet at St Mark's Church Hall at Bell Reeve, which is opposite the new Salamanca Fresh, if you know that. I think it's Scott Street. Um, and we ask for, a, I think it's a $2 or $3 donation if you're a member. Member and a five dollar donation if you're not a member, just to cover the cost of the whole hire. And I also want to mention too that the Family History Society, the Hobart branch at Bell Reeve, has very recently become a Family Search affiliate library. That means that if you're looking on Family Search, doing a search, and you get one of those things where there's a padlock because it's a locked record and you want to see an image you can go to the library at Bell Reeve Family History Library and you can access it from there. Um, otherwise, the only other choice is to go out to Goodwood, I think, where the church is, where the main library is. But we're now an affiliate library. We're the only one in Tasmania. But it's a really great service to be able to provide. Okay, let's get down to DNA. <laughs> um, and today I'm going to talk about using DNA to solve family history mysteries. I'm going to start out by talking about just a brief understanding about DNA and how it works, because some of you will know this probably inside out, but some of you may be new to it. And it gives you a background of how I then work to solve family history mysteries, which I will get into. And getting your DNA results. Um, um, how many of you have been tested here? Oh, quite a few of you, okay. It can be overwhelming and confusing, you probably know that. Um, and I'm going to cover some of the basic concepts today, but it's also worth doing some online reading. Because being able to interpret your DNA results can lead to exciting breakthroughs in your family history, especially if you have a mystery or a brick wall in your family tree. Um, or if you discover a mystery that you actually weren't looking for. DNA has enabled people of all ages, but very often older people, to break through brick walls in their family history research, sometimes with quite profound outcomes. If you've dug around in the DNA world, you'll know that um, adoptees are overrepresented in, in the 
matches that you'll get in the people who've had their DNA done. And that's because they're seeking to resolve the mystery of their genetic past. In Australia, most um, adoptees can access their mother's um, or their birth certificate, which will almost always just show their mother's name, but not their father's. Sometimes they can make contact if it was a mother baby home where you were born. Sometimes they have a record of who the mother said the father was, but most often it's a total mystery and the only way you're ever going to find it is by DNA. So skilled analysis can identify an unknown parent, usually a father um, or even two parents. And I have worked on a couple of um, cases, one case where a mother, a woman gave a false name and was never ever going to be found. Um, but actually when she was found, she was thrilled to have been found and was still alive. Um, sometimes it can also solve the mystery of an illegitimate um, grandparent, but it does get harder the more generations you go back. Grandparent is challenging, and I'll talk about that later. Um, it does get harder. Just be aware that what you might find might not be what you're expecting to find. Um, and we say that when somebody's getting their DNA tested, we should warn them about that. And I was contacted by a 94-year-old um, woman who was actually a member of the Family History Society, member number five, um, still, still keeps the membership up, living in a nursing home. She rang up and she said, I'd like to get my DNA done, <laughs> but I don't have access to a computer or anything. Anyway, I said I'd help her. I actually purchased a kit which she refunded me for and I set up an account for her and did everything else. She was an only child who had never married. And I said to her, just be aware you might find something that you don't expect to find. And once she asked me, like, like what? Oh, I think she would more politely. And I said, well, you may discover that your father had a child with someone else before he was married. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> And I thought, you'll be right. <laughs> there are several popular testing companies for those interested in doing their DNA. Each has different services and tools. Some may have ongoing costs to use their tools or access matches family trees. Um, be aware that Ancestry DNA, which is usually the most popular, allows you to download your DNA raw data and upload it to some of the other sites but you can't upload to, the, to, to Ancestry. So if you don't test um, with Ancestry first, then you can't ever sort of put your DNA onto their site. Do your homework regarding ethical issues such as potential sale of your supposedly de-identified DNA and whether it can be accessed for forensic purposes. The, um, with Ancestry, you, I always say no to research um, because that is allowing your DNA to be sold, de-identified and sold, and I personally don't feel comfortable about that. Ancestry doesn't allow, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on now about forensic research solving um, murders, and, and Australia, I think, will start moving into unidentified um, remains. We're not doing it yet, but... They are certainly doing a lot of that, the Jane Doe's or whatever. Um, Ancestry does not allow the DNA from those, in those cases, to be uploaded onto their site. The only sites that are allowing it are GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA, and both of them you can opt out of if you choose to. Um, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy has a useful comparison chart if you want to look at what different companies provide. There are also third-party DNA, DNA sites and tools. Um, for example, um, Jetbatch, um, and they you can potentially match with a much larger combined pool of people if you upload your DNA onto, for example, Jetmatch, um, which has a free basic membership and a small fee for additional tools. So people who've tested with all different companies can upload their um, tends to be the people who are more interested. Um, so that's the um, July 2022 data. 
for how many people have tested. And you can see at a glance that Ancestry DNA has by far the biggest database of potential matches with 21 million. Um, the next biggest one is 23andMe with what 12 million and 800,000. But it's almost all of the, if you test with them, almost all of your matches will be in North America because it's primarily a health, it gives you health data, but only if you live, it's not available to get your health data if you don't live in America. So um, most of the people who test with that are, are there. Um, the more people in the company's database, the more, more chance you have of matching with someone important to your research. However, that said, there are some, Ancestry DNA has a lot of people from Australia, New Zealand and Britain. Um, my heritage is actually an Israeli company and they tend to, if you've got Jewish ancestry that you're curious about, that's a really good place to have your DNA. Um, and they also tend to have, I'm told, a few more European testers. There are three types of DNA tests, Y DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and autosomal DNA. And I'm not gonna go into the first two here because they're for specialized research. Autosomal DNA is what we refer to when we loosely talk about DNA testing. Males and females can test, there's no difference, and it identifies segments of DNA that you inherited from your paternal and maternal ancestors, so it goes both sides, back about six generations, sometimes a bit further, that's more than is shown in this diagram. Um, beyond that, the DNA from a specific ancestor is generally too diluted to be reliable and you can get false matches. While you're waiting for your DNA results, build or upload a family tree and attach yourself to the tree in your DNA, attach your DNA to yourself in the tree. That's probably the most useful thing you can do to understand your DNA results. It can be a private tree if, you're, if you prefer, but from my perspective, I'd much rather that you didn't put private trees up because when I want to look at how somebody is related to somebody else, then private trees are very frustrating. But, you know, a lot of people have reasons why they want to, and I certainly use them sometimes too. Start by putting in all your direct ancestors. I mean, you can upload a JEDCOM um, if you've got one, or you can just start building one by putting in your direct ancestors as many as you know, then add siblings and spouses. <coughs> the more you can flesh out your tree, the easier it will be to work out how you're related to DNA matches, because they're probably going to be descended from um, <coughs> siblings. Um, <coughs> or the site, um, Some sites like Ancestry will use the information you put in to suggest how you may be related to a specific person. that are things called through lines. <coughs> so what do you get from autosomal DNA testing? <coughs> An online account through which you can access your broad ethnicity estimates, regions or groups where your ancestors may have come from um, usually centuries ago and it will be expressed as X percent Irish, Scottish, X percent Scandinavian, X percent Ashkenazi, Jewish, etc. But do take your ethnicity with a grain of salt as it is an estimate. It's as good as the reference groups that they use and they can change as the reference groups are updated. If you test with multiple companies or upload your DNA to other companies, your ethnicity estimates will be different on every site because they use different reference groups. It's a, as I said, it's an inexact science, but for some people it can be useful. Um, each person has two strands of chromosomes, one from each parent, but we only inherit half of our father's DNA and half of our mother's DNA, and it's random which segments make up that half. A full sibling will inherit a different set of random segments. In this simplified example, the DNA from my great-grandparents is represented by the eight coloured bars in the top row. My parents inherited half of their DNA from each of their parents. 
but my pants DNA is not exactly 50% of each pants two colours. Um, for example, my mother, the right-hand um, parent, has more of her father's orange DNA than his blue DNA. And my DNA is a random half of my parents' DNA. Um, I certainly don't get 25% from each grandparent. Um, and in fact, note here that I've not inherited any purple DNA from my paternal grandmother. If one of her parents, the one with the purple DNA, was from a particular cultural group, and I'll just say, for example, Jewish, um, it would not show up in my ethnicity estimates. Not because she wasn't Jewish and I don't have Jewish ancestry, it's just I didn't happen to get any of her DNA that was relevant to identifying <coughs> her Jewish ancestry. So just because you don't get it doesn't mean it's not there once you get a few generations back. However, siblings might have inherited some different bits of DNA and they, it might show up in their DNA. <coughs> the ancestry adverts don't tell you, but you also get many matches to other people whose results are in the same company's database and are related to you in recent generations. For family history purposes, and especially if you have a mystery, this is the most interesting and potentially useful part of DNA testing. And this is what a list of matches will look like on Ancestry DNA. There will be thousands of them if you include the distant matches. They'll be listed by relationship, closest relations first. Each company presents them a bit differently. The bigger the company's database of testers, the more potential matches you'll have. So there are three basic concepts, concepts that are important to understand. What a match is and a common ancestor the amount of total DNA you share with your match and shared matches. In this simplified example, um, oh, it's lost its, okay, we're not gonna get that. <laughs> it's lost its um, pictures, I don't know why. Um, it's looking at basically me and a match going back to com the common ancestors. So if you imagine a line of um, from my mother and my perhaps my mother's father, it doesn't matter whether it's male or female, going back um, and one line and the other line from my match going back until we intersect with a common ancestor. And that's basically what a common ancestor is. It's the person that you share, the ancestor that you share. Um, and in this example, which you can't see, I'm sorry, um, my match and I are in the same generation, but you can actually be in a different generation. Um, when you get to my age, a lot of my matches will be younger than me rather than older. Shared matches, sometimes called in common with matches, are the people on your list of matches who are also on a selected matches list of matches because they all share some of the same DNA. All the companies have a way of selecting a match and then clicking on shared matches or in common with to bring up this list of matches that are on your DNA and on your matches DNA. Really, really useful tool, use it all the time. Um, in this example, I'm MH and I've selected my match MR. I click on shared matches and it brings up four other matches from my list. Usually it will bring up a lot more than four, um, who are also on MR's list of matches, which means we would all be descended from the same common ancestors, usually a couple. Um, the shared matches tool is probably the most helpful one you've got. Um, using shared matches, you can work work out how your DNA matches might be related to you, or at least which part of your family tree they fit into. And if you recognise or know how you're related to just one of the people in your group of shared matches, um, or they have a good tree and you can see how you're related, then you can know how you're related to the rest of them in a general way, um, even if the common ancestor is quite a number of generations back. And shared matches are what you work with all the time if you have a mystery match who has no family tree attached or if you have an unknown ancestor or brick wall. So each company is different, but for each match, you can usually see 
an estimate of the relationship, for example, second to third cousin, fifth to remote, but be aware that's an estimate. It's sort of a suggestion of what it might be. Um, some sites, such as Ancestry, can, if you work out exactly how you're related, you can go in and actually change that estimate to the, what the real thing is. It also shows you the total amount of shared DNA in centimorgans or, or percent. Um, and usually we work with centimorgans. Um, they're a unit of measure for DNA. It's a complicated definition. You can look it up if you like. Um, but it's what we work with. Um, the more centimorgans you share with a match, the more closely you are related to them. Now, what's gone wrong with these? Your computer is not bringing up my images. I don't know why. Uh, this file was a little bit corrupted, so you might have lost it. Oh, okay. Um, look, look, this is Blaine Bettinger's chart, which is on. Um, ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogists, I would have even bought your copy and shown it to you. Um, I, I have a laminated copy, in fact I have multiple ones because I just use it all the time. Um, and it, um, it shows you how closely you relate to someone and how many generations back the common ancestor might be. What Blaine Bettinger did is he collected statistics from the genetic genealogy community for a number of years and he asked um, people to send him the total number of centimorgans they share with a match where they know exactly how they're related to that match. Um, for example, I might share 220 centimorgans with a known second cousin. And Bedinger has then compiled all that data from over 25,000 known relationships and produced this chart. It is available online if you um, search for um, you can go to that site, but it's called the Shared CM Project. If you search for the Shared CM Project, you'll find it fairly easily. We can bring that up in the PC at the back for, for anyone that's interested who wants to stay behind. Um, okay, so we've got some of it there, some of it's missing. Um, you use the amount of DNA you share with, share with a match and you find the options on the chart that that are closest to the average. So for each um, each relationship on the chart, it's got, um, for example, aunt, uncle, it will tell you that 1,741 is the average amount of DNA you would expect to find in that relationship. But the range, and that's a really important figure, the range is one, what, 1,201 to 2,282. So I've never ever found a, a relationship that fell outside that range. And in fact, usually it's more towards the average. It's not one of the outliers at either end. And maybe we'll get luckier. Ah, now that's actually a picture of the chart I was trying to show you. Um, that's the online version and, and that's available on a site called dnapainter.com. It's a free tool of available there that you can use. And if you put in the amount of DNA that you share in the little box that I've circled up the top and press the button, it then tells you what the likely relationship is. And it gives you all the different options and tells you the probabilities. It's more, you know, more likely this one than that one. And it could be that, but it's less likely. So it's a really good way of um, working it out. Okay. So, how do I use DNA to confirm ancestry or solve family history mysteries? Um, this is the approach that I use um, to find an unknown parent or mystery ancestor, and, um, and or even if I'm wanting to make sense of matches. I first um, sort the matches into four grandparent groups using shared matches and and allocating coloured dots, and that's called the Leeds method. Um, if you Google the Leeds method, you will find it quite easily. Um, it's the single most useful thing you can do with your DNA matches, and I thoroughly recommend to all of you that you do it. Um, but 
basically what you're doing is you're trying to sort them into your four grandparent lines. So you um, you basically start with a, a shared match, um, and it's got you've got to start with a second cousin or or more remote. First cousins will share two grandparents, so you don't want first cousins. You want to, <coughs> for example, a second cousin who's only related to me on my paternal grandfather's line. I start with that match, and I <coughs> then look at their shared matches. And on ancestry in my heritage, you can allocate a coloured dot. So in this case, I've chosen blue for my. Um, Paternal grandfather's matches and all his well, common ancestor is upstream from him. And um, <coughs> I give them all a blue dot. And then I go into my paternal grandmother's ancestors. I've chosen a purple dot for them, green for my paternal grandfather because he was Irish, and um, pink for my maternal grandmother. And so I just basically divide all of my... Um, DNA matches into four groups. And then <coughs> if I want to explore one of those groups, I can actually select the blue dot group, for example, and work with it. Now, if there's an unknown parent or grandparent, um, and you, for example, only know three of your four groups, and you don't know the other one, <coughs> or you only know two of them, I, I find the matches it's really important to do this because what I, say I'm looking for a father, I want to label all of the maternal matches because I want to rule them out. And the people who aren't related on the mother's side must therefore, the ones that are left over, must well, most likely are going to be related on the father's side. And then I start sorting them into groups and I often will label them um, mystery group one or mystery group two or whatever, just getting them into groups. Um, and they're the matches that I'll then start to work with to find the unknown parent. The next thing I do is to build um, what's called quick and dirty trees or research trees from matches fragment trees. Those of you that have had your DNA done will know that you get these frustrating people that you're matching with and they've got like four people in their tree or something, and <laughs> you need to build it out. Um, I do a lot of this, um, and I I happen to have an ancestry subscription because I couldn't live without it, but you could also use Family Search um, or, or a subscription to another site where you have your um, tree. So that's looking at an example of getting a fragment tree, almost nothing, and it's, this is a genuine example, I've taken out surnames, but um, where there are only a few people, but enough for me to find who did they marry, who were their parents, and I could build out a whole tree. And then sometimes, bingo, ah, that's the common ancestors I was looking for. I know exactly where you fit into this person's tree. And it's a really wonderful way of, of working with people. Um, quick and dirty trees, because they're, they're called that because you basically break the rules of genealogical research. You copy other people's trees or they'll be very wary, you know, like look at them, does this sort of match the pub test? Have they got women having babies when they were 74 and, you know, one baby born here and then the next this one's born in England and another one's born in Australia and, you know, stuff that just doesn't look plausible. But if you can find reliable-looking trees, you can use trees. And that's why you make it private and preferably non-searchable because you are just building a quick and dirty tree. Um, and then um, if you can get to an ancestor that you're interested in, you can then... Um, start building down again and putting in children and grandchildren. Um, so the other thing that I do is I use the what are the odds or Watto tool, um, lovely name, um, to work out where the mystery person might fit into the tree. And that's a picture of it. It's on DNA Painter. 
Um, you can build one Watto tree without being a member, other than that you've got to pay a very small membership fee. And what you do is you sort of build a tree on this, and I think you can now upload trees. Um, and then you put in the matches when you know exactly where they fit into that tree. You put them in with the amount of DNA that they share. And then you press the find hypothesis button, you tell it what you're looking for, and it will put suggestions in these blue boxes of where the person that you're looking for might fit in that tree, person whose DNA you're using, um, might fit in that tree and what the probability is. And I think in this case, um, there's a probability up there for hypothesis one that's 96 times more likely than the next hypothesis. And that's probably going to be what you're looking for. It's not always the highest hypothesis though. And I just actually cracked something this morning that I have been working on for some time. And it was not the highest hypothesis, but it was the second highest. Um, and one of a number of options. Um, so that's a, I find that as a really useful tool to guide me. So this is where we get into the interesting bit, um, where um, I want to, and I just want to add that um, I have permission to use these stories, I always ask, but I've changed names and de-identified them, so they um, are de-identified. Um, and I, one of the things I really like to do, this is, I think, my own, it is my own, yes, um, to make one of these circular family trees, there are various tools that you can use to, to do it. I've actually printed it out on a large bit, well, I had office works do it on a large bit of um, light card and had it laminated. And um, I'm in the middle and with my parents above and below. The next circle is the four grandparents and then each circle is the next generation out to the three times great grandparents. And the orange lines divide the child. I just put those in for, to help you have to see that they're dividing them into each of the four grandparent lines like the leads meeting. <laughs> And then I've put stars on where I've confirmed an ancestor, ancestor or couple by matching with one or more of the um, people who share that common ancestor. So with DNA, somebody is descended from a sibling of my ancestor and that's the common ancestors. Um, and I've been confident that, I'm, that I've confirmed them. And so it's been, for me, that this is the most useful thing from my DNA. I've only come across one mystery, but to be able to confirm all the work that I've done for many years. Um, I've put a circle there around my convict ancestors. I only have one pair of them, and they were very early convicts. But it's been hugely exciting to match with a number of third cousins and beyond who are descended from the same convicts, and that's my really exciting, it's um, um, special. Um, uh, okay, you have to imagine, similar tree to before, it's um, Trisha's family tree. She had no, no reason to expect anything unusual, and so we were surprised to find that she had no matches confirming her paternal grandfather's tree. You see the segment down below, if we go back to the previous one, where I've got all those blue dots there, she had absolutely no matches there in her paternal grandfather's tree, despite them having large families where you would have expected matches. Um, and she matched with cousins who proved that she was descended from her paternal grandmother. And so the question is, had we made a mistake with her tree and somehow put her grandfather's ancestry in incorrectly, or had there been an NPE event, not parent expected? Her father died a couple of years ago without having his DNA tested, and that's a big regret of ours. Um, he was one of 11 children. But his sister Margaret, Trisha's aunt, agreed to have her DNA done. And guess what? She had DNA matches on the paternal grandfather side, matches that Trish didn't have. So, um, so Trish 
down the bottom here in the sort of pinkish one, has matches with her paternal grandmother, Jessie's um, German ancestry, and lots of good matches there, but no, no DNA matches with anyone in the H family. However, her aunt Margaret has matches with the H family really nicely. So, um, and in fact matches with a, a, a cousin over there that um, Trish doesn't match with. Um, the only explanation that we can come to really when you analyse it is that Ken's father is not Jack H. Um, Margaret's father is Jack H, but Ken's isn't. But his mother is Jessie uh, um, so he wasn't adopted secretly. Um, and Ken H and Margaret H share the amount of DNA that makes them half siblings, or sort of how we work it out. Um, so Ken was born in 944 while his father was stationed in far north Queensland. You know what was happening in 944. And he was said to be a leave baby. <laughs> And we managed to get his, um, had to request it, but we got his um, service, service record from the Second World War. And yes, he did have leave about eight months before the birth. Although Ken was a lot, and I was counting back weeks, and so I did my checks about how many weeks I had to count back and everything. He was a large and apparently full term baby. And the suggestion is that his conception probably was before Jack came home from leave, given that he had to get, we know the starting date of his leave, and he had to get back down. So if Jack was not Ken's father, then who was? An American serviceman bearing silk stockings? A neighbor providing support? A new or long-time friend? And we, the DNA research has some leads. There's a collection of otherwise unattributable matches but none of them are close enough, and basically we are still working on it. Um, it's much harder to find a grandfather than a father. And the moral of this story really is get a sample done while you can. If you've got some older family members, don't regret that, that um, you know you didn't get their DNA done while you could. So this is an extremely challenging case that I um, worked on last year. Um, I was contacted by Jane, a young woman in New Zealand. She'd been talking to Derek, who's a third cousin of mine on my Escot side, who also lives in New Zealand. And he was showing up in her DNA results as an 84 Sandy Morgan match, an estimated third to fourth cousin, but he was the closest DNA match she could identify on her paternal grandfather's line. She didn't match with me, um, but Derek suggested she contact me to see if I could help because he knows what I do. So Jane wrote, um, I'll tell you why I've got this picture. <laughs> what do I think I know about my grandfather? My father William is 52. He was conceived in Auckland around March 1969. My dad's mother has said it was a one night stand and that the man left the next morning on a ship to Australia. She said he was in the army, although we don't really know what to believe. She said that the mother is fairly unreliable. She also mentioned that he was British. Her, my dad was brought up by his, her, his mother, no, well, the, the mother's mother, the grandmother. They're a Maori Pacific Islander family. My grandmother chose a given name, William, and picked a random surname for him, <laughs> just out of the blue. All my life I've felt our surname wasn't real and didn't mean anything. My dad's father would be in his, at least in his early 70s by now. We'd love to identify him and hope that he might still be alive, although I realise this is an almost impossible task. And the reason I put this picture up here is that I'm like a dog with a bone if you give me a challenge like that. Um, now, this is Jane's ancestry, um, just in a symbolic way. Um, I wasn't interested in the green, purple or pink matches because she knew this part of her family. Um, she knew who her mother's family were and she knew who her father's mother's family because he'd been kept in the family. Um, so, but I had to identify um, as many of the pink, purple and green people as I could because I had to rule them out. 
um, the un, um, in order to identify who the unknown matches were. Um, and because the unknown father was said to be from overseas, he was most likely to be related in a way um, not related by, to anyone born in New Zealand. Um, at least that was my hope. Um, so my first line of approach was to start with my third cousin, Derek, um, as he appeared to be related on the mystery grandfather's line. And there were only three shared matches, but fortunately they all had trees. And I did one of those what are, what are the odds trees on DNA Painter, but it wouldn't give me any probabilities because the matches were too few and too distant. It just said, no, you need closer matches. I identified a few more small groups of unallocated matches who were related to each other and unrelated to the lines I was interested in. Uh, they were probably distant matches on William's paternal line. I gave each group a coloured dot and called it paternal unattached group one, paternal unattached group two, etc. They were all small matches with either very small trees or no trees. I built out lots of quick and dirty trees based on the fragments. Um, but I couldn't make any connections between these trees as I couldn't find common surnames or locations. It was frustrating. And I felt like I was searching for needles in a haystack. The matches I were, were looking, was looking for, which were these, this group of what from one grand grandparent, were completely swamped with the irrelevant green dot matches to Jane's paternal Maori Pacific Islander grandmother. It seemed like all of her, all of the mystery um, grandfather came from a tree who were not into DNA testing. Um, and she told me that the, um, the and the Mary Pacific, uh, she told me that the Mary Pacific Islanders often had 15 kids and I think they had 15 kids and, um, and all of them got their DNA tested. <laughs> but they were just absolutely swamping everything I was trying to look at. Then Jane told me they had given her father, William, an ancestry DNA kit for his birthday. And I felt like that was our best hope as I'd been working on DNA one generation closer um, to William's unknown father. Um, the matches might be bigger and there might even be a useful matches show up in his DNA results that were too small to be in his daughter's DNA. So we waited, his DNA came back quickly, fortunately, and um, I then started the job of allocating coloured dots <laughs> again. Um, this time I simply gave green dots to all his maternal ancestors, whether they were, you know, which grand, doesn't matter whether it was the maternal grandmother or maternal grandfather, um, so I could rule them out. And if they were basically New Zealand-born, Maori Pacific Islander, um, I just gave them a green dot there. And I did shared matches of shared matches. And eventually, um, there were thousands of them, but I got of doing green dots, I can tell you. The paternal matches suggested an important common ancestor was likely to be from the Arnold Breeds family. But therein lay a problem. Were they all really Breeds? And Elizabeth Arnold had married Daniel Breeds in England, and they had two children before he was sentenced to 14 years transportation in 1840 for stealing two pennies worth of pepper. And off he went to Van Diemen's land. So he left the scene in 1840. She stayed in England and she had three more children. Now, because she was a breed, her married name, their surname was all breed or breeds, they were inter interchangeable. But their actual father or fathers were unknown. I didn't even know if it was one father or several fathers. If one of these children was William's ancestor, they could introduce a whole unknown cluster of matches into the confusing mix because we had an unknown father there. And I'm sure most of you, if you've been digging around on um, places like Ancestry, you'll know that most of them said that Daniel Breeze, most of the other trees said Daniel Breeze was the father of all these children that were born after he came here. I also checked out what happened to him when he came to Tasmania and he did marry again, but he didn't have any children that I could trace. Um, so once I became confident that William was descended from one of the five legitimate or illegitimate breeds children, 
I know that their spouses' names and surnames, and that's really important, and their children's spouses' surnames. If I could narrow down which one of the breed's children was William's ancestor, we'd get one generation closer. And if you can get matches to a spouse's family tree, you know that you can go down a generation. The five breed's children had 15 children between them. Most had married and most of those 15 had married and had descendants. I started exploring spouses' surnames for potential matches, building out trees. If I could get DNA matches to one of the spouse's family lines, then I could triangulate and focus in on um, where that spouse line connected to the breed's line. William should theoretically, theoretically be descended from that couple. I built quick and dirty tree after quick and dirty tree. I methodically built trees up and to common ancestors and down and sideways from all the surnames I was exploring. They were mostly Sussex families and some, not helpful, were interconnected by marriage, so it was a tangled web. I started exploring several distant matches who had a Hankerson, and now that's a name I've changed, um, in their tree, but could not find any connection. It was just an unusual name that came up in a number of people. Other than most of the Hankersons seemed to come from a place called Lewes in Sussex. So perhaps it was just a Sussex name, so what? But at least it was unusual. Uh, lovely when you get an unusual surname. So the match matches had a more likely chance of being connected. I built a massive Hankerson tree, trying to connect up the matches who had Hankersons in their trees. And slowly a few connections between them emerged. I built another Watto tree and looked at the probabilities. And eventually I found a breed granddaughter, Amelia, who had married a Frederick George Hankerson. So there was a connection between the Breeds and the Hankersons. And it looked like they were William's great-grandparents, so I was one generation closer. That meant William's father had to be one of the, the children of um, Amelia and Frederick George Hankerson's seven children, so they had to be the grandparents. I could rule out two of the children, Florence and Lily, because two of his DNA matches were descended from them, and the matches didn't share enough DNA for William to also be descended from them, if that makes sense. The two youngest children were less likely because it would be a very tight to fit in another generation who would be old enough to father a child in 1969. I think the youngest one there is um, 1930, and if they have a child, then the child's got to be old enough to father a child in 1969. It's getting a bit tight. So I started exploring the ancestry of the Hankerson's children's spouses. Frederick, the eldest son, start with the eldest, got lucky here, married someone called Gwen Dan. And William had no matches with Dan in their tree. You can put surnames into search by sur spouse's surname in ancestry and I looked and nobody else had a Dan in their tree. So I then started building a tree for Gwen Dan, and her mother was Lily Message, another slightly unusual surname. And bingo, William had message, matches with the Message family. Same location, unusual surname, surely, surely not a coincidence. More quick tree building revealed that two of William's matches shared a common ancestor couple with Lily Message. William must therefore be descended from the Dan Message family as well as the Hankersons. His grandparents had to be Frederick Hankerson and Gwen Dan, who married in 1936 in a house from Sussex, England. There was a tree on ancestry which showed that Frederick and Gwen had two sons, who they conveniently told me were called Ronald and John. And one of those two sons, and I didn't know if there were other sons who weren't there, but Ronald and John were more likely, one of them was likely to be William's father. I wrote to Jane with the exciting news and told her to go sleuthing. This is where I bow out and I say, yeah, you go digging. It was late one evening New Zealand time, but she replied, I'm over the moon, you superstar. You've, I've read your email over and over. I can't believe it. I'm so excited. I don't know if I can get to sleep. That's why. I've got this picture here. 
So Jane got on to Facebook, as you do. <laughs> the unusual surname Hankerson and the Sussex location were helpful, and she quickly tracked down Ronald's son. Um, so there were these two brothers, Ronald and John, and she cracked out, she tracked down Ronald's son and she messaged him. And after 15 minutes, because I guess it was, she was in the middle of the night and it was probably daytime in England, he replied and they started an exchange. He was understandably sceptical and thought it was just another scam, um, but she persisted. She had a lot at stake and she wasn't going to give up now. <laughs> and she said, um, I said to her, ask whether Ronald or John might have been in New Zealand in 1969. And so she asked that question and he said, ah, oh, well, Uncle John was in the Navy. He might have been in New Zealand in, back then. So he phoned his Uncle John and he said, um, there's a person in New Zealand who's looking for their um, grandfather. You know, were you in New Zealand in 1969? <laughs> John was speechless because he had been holding onto a secret for over 50 years. In 1969, he was a single young man in the Navy. His ship went to Singapore, then stopped in Auckland for three days. He remembers an evening of music, dancing, and then a liaison with a young Maori lady. <laughs> the ship left the next morning for Australia and he never saw her again. And remember, William's mother had said it was a one night stand, the man left the next morning on a ship to Australia and he was in the army and she also thought he was British. After John's ship returned to the UK, he was asked one day to come into the office and he was told that a woman in New Zealand was looking for him because she was pregnant. He was not in a good place at the time and he felt he couldn't mentally deal with it. He didn't contact her and it had haunted him his whole life. He's held on to the guilt of not doing anything about it at the time. He told no one. He'd always wondered if she terminated the pregnancy or if he had a child and whether the child had been well brought up and whatever. Donald had a terrible upbringing. When he and his brother were young, their father died in a work accident. The mother was ill and frequently had long periods in hospital. The boys were moved around a lot. He left home at 12 and joined the Navy. He said he wasn't trying to make excuses, but it really was a dark time. And he didn't really settle down until he met his wife that he's still with. She already had two children and they didn't have any more children together. So he'd never had any children. He was overjoyed to have been found and for his secret to be out at last. He told everybody he could think of telling. His wife, and I'm on her side, was initially upset with him for not contacting William's mother when he went there all those years ago. Um, but she's now forgiven him and she shares his joy at having a son and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. He's since done a DNA test, which confirmed everything that we thought, but it was hardly necessary. The DNA evidence correlated exactly with him being in the right place at the right time for the conception to have occurred. And the fact that he actually knew about it. Um, and William's mother had thought he was the father. Um, Jane wrote to me, I'm delighted to let you know that I spoke with my grandfather last night for the first time. She and her family were just oh, over the moon about it all. Although she'd been determined to find her father's father for him, she said it was something deep down she thought couldn't be solved. And she knew as the years went by, there was less and less chance that she would have a living long lost grandfather. There's been another little unexpected benefit from all my hard work doing all those um, quick and dirty trees. John Hankerson had lost his father when he was young and spent most of his childhood separated from his mother. He'd never known what his family tree was. And suddenly we give him, well, here's your family tree going back multiple, multiple generations that I had to do. And he, he's been really excited about that. Uh, Jane later wrote, um, Papa John has been calling us at least weekly and talking for hours at a time, which has been lovely. He messages me almost every day. All the photos of him when he was young look just like my dad. I don't know how how easily you can see that of the two of them. He keeps saying how proud he is of, he is of his son and that he's telling everyone about his newfound family. Um, he and Dad have so much in common. Dad left home very young to make his own way in the world. And I contacted her recently just to ask her about permission to share this. And she said that um, 
Papa John is coming to New Zealand with his wife and stepdaughter to meet us in October. My partner and I will be getting married in October and I'm over the moon that my newfound grandfather will be there. And William's wife also wrote to me and she said he's a man of few words, but she said what I had done for them has been life changing. And I think that probably sums it up really well. Um, <laughs> Paula was born in 1952 and adopted into a loving family and she knew that she was adopted. In the 1980s she applied for a routine birth certificate and as expected the certificate had her adoptive parents as her parents but must have been some mistake it also had her birth mother's full name and it sparked her curiosity and she found and met with her mother and her mother said that she had been pregnant at 14, gave birth to Paula when she was 15, and then her mother had actually married at 17 because she was pregnant again, but Paula was given up for adoption. On about their third meeting, Paula's mother said, I think you have a right to know who your father was, and she told Paula her father's name and gave her a photo and said that he was a, a married man when they had the affair. Paula's father, Bruce, was 23 and married with two children when he formed a, li a liaison with her 14-year-old mother. And I actually checked and the legal age of consent was 14 in 1952. Paula phoned him in the 1980s um, when she sort of found out who he was. Fortunately, he answered the phone. He said he knew she existed. He'd been aware that he'd fathered a child. They had one conversation he explained his situation that he was married with three kids. She didn't want to intrude on their life or upset his wife, so she had no further contact but that one phone call. She then moved into state and then overseas and was away for more than 30 years. She returned to Australia and she knew her mother had died while she was away, but she expressed an interest in connecting with her paternal siblings now that her father would be deceased and presumably his wife. Um, she knew her father's surname, where he had lived and worked in the 1980s, but she couldn't recall his given name. And we searched old electoral rolls, but we couldn't find anyone with that surname who fitted her description, and she just could not remember his first name. So DNA was the only answer. She had four matches who appeared to be first cousins, two maternal and two paternal. Um, contact was made through ancestry with Jody, her closest paternal match, appeared to be a first cousin. Long story, but Jody had found out some years ago that Paula existed, that Uncle Bruce had had an affair and kept hoping that Paula would one day turn up as a DNA match, because Jody was really into family history. So it was a really warm welcome, and when she, she was just embraced into the family. Paula was surprised to learn that the father, um, she had never met, was still alive in his 90s and living at home. His wife had died, so she couldn't be hurt. Paula had two legitimate older brothers and a younger sister who Jody thought would not know about Paula at all. Jody decided to phone one of Paula's brothers, her cousin, so she was being the intermediary. And she phoned one of the brothers and she mentioned that she connected with someone on DNA and did he know that his father had had a child outside the marriage? And he surprised her when he said, oh, yes, I know that. They continued to talk for a while until somehow they realised the pronouns were not the same. Jodie was talking about a she and the brother was talking about a he. Now you know why I've got this photo. picture. <laughs> it seems Bruce had fathered another illegitimate child, a son, about 12 years after Paula was born. This boy was not adopted and had been raised by his single mother and he'd actually come to meet his father a few years ago and that's how the family had become aware of him. So the skeletons were coming out of the closet. Jodie took Paula to meet her father. She looked at his face and knew there had been no mistake with the DNA. They do look quite similar. His 90-plus-year-old brain took a few minutes to compute, but then he knew that she was his daughter and remembered who she was and how she fitted in. Paula later met his three children, her half-siblings, and has formed a good relationship with them all. And they connected with the other half-brother who lives overseas. He, the half-brother then said, oh, well, 
I actually have another brother, also Bruce's son, <laughs> who was given up for adoption. And he told Paul I had to contact him, and he was still living locally. DNA has since confirmed that they are both Bruce's sons from a long affair he had during his marriage. Seems like he had two homes for a while there. I don't know how people do it, but anyway. Three legitimate children and three illegitimate. Bruce is now in a nursing home, and yes, he is still chatting up the women there. Um, and I think I might finish there. Uh, yep. um, I think I'll finish there. Oh, unless you want one, one, do you want one short one? Yes, please. Yes, please, okay. Um, this is one of the simplest DNA mysteries I've taken on. Sally had been adopted happily. She had traced her and met her biological mother when she was in her late teens, but her mother was a bit flaky. She told Sally various stories about who her father was. The most reliable information came from another member of the mother's family who said um, the mother had been having an affair with a much older married man and it had ended just before she discovered she was pregnant. So Sally had her DNA done with Ancestry and she asked me for help and there were no apparent close matches on Ancestry and I suggested she upload her DNA onto MyHeritage. Bingo. Her closest match, Fanola, appeared um, from the amount of DNA to be a half-sister, a paternal half-sister. Um, you don't usually get as lucky as that. Um, unusual name and surname, so I Googled the half-sister and I got dozens of hits. She was a young fashion designer who had recently launched her own high-end clothing label. She was interviewed by all the magazines everywhere. Um, so I hand it over to Sally, who once again did the Facebook stalking. It's not my department, I do the DNA. <laughs> um, and it's surprising how many people have poor security settings and you can read all their posts and see all their photos. Sally quickly found photos of Fanola's father, Rob's 60th birthday party. She then found an email address for him. I'm not sure how she did that. Um, maybe on LinkedIn or something. And, then, and found that he still lived in the town where she was born and where her mother still lived. He was the same age as her mother. Um, not a much older man has had been suggested. So she just bra bravely sent him an email and said, um, this is where, when and where I was born. This is who my birth mother was. DNA suggests for Nola is my half-sister and I think you're probably my father. No messing about. <laughs> And he replied within a couple of hours. <laughs> he said he had no recollection of ever meeting her mother, <laughs> but he was interested to explore it more. Um, of course, um, he had no idea of how DNA matching worked and why Sally thought Fanola could be her half-sister, you know, because someone coming in doesn't understand any of these things. Um, but what he did um, do is he arranged to have coffee with her mother her mother didn't turn up the first time and he was persistent and he, she turned up the second time. Neither of them could remember ever, ever meeting before. <laughs> but both acknowledged that back then they had been in the same social circles in the same town. That was as good as they could get. Rob then arranged and paid for an expensive three-way paternity-maternity test where he tested himself the mother and Sally. So each of them did it, not with ancestry or anything, it was with one of these companies that does paternity and maternity testing. Um, no surprises in the results. He was her father, um, as I knew he would be. Um, he was pleased to discover that he was, um, welcomed her. He flew across the country um, with his wife to meet her, took her out to dinner at a very expensive restaurant, um, her and her husband and, and daughter. And yeah, daughter. So our guess is that they had a liaison at a fairly drunken party. Perhaps when her mother was on the rebound from her recently ended affair with the older man. That's the best because neither of them can remember. <laughs> <laughs> so in short, if you get your DNA tested, be prepared for what you might find. Um, you never know what you're going to lean into or whether someone's going to write to you and say, 
Oh, I think your father might be my father. <laughs> um, so, now, are there any questions? Yes. What constitutes a, um, a good DNA sample? Like, does it have to be saliva or could it be hair? Or um, at the moment, with the, the testing companies, um, they send you a kit to collect a sample. Ancestry sends you a little thing to do a whole lot of spitting in. Um, family Tree DNA sends you a cheek swab test. At this point, none of the testing companies will accept hair in any of those. There is a company called From the Letter, I think it's called, in Australia. Australian company that is getting into artefact testing of deceased people. It's called from the letter probably because they have started out testing the, if you've got a, a letter, like I've got the love letters between my parents and where they've licked the gum on the back of the envelope, where I hope they licked the gum on the back of the envelope, the, and, it's, and it's remained sealed because it was just torn off. Um, the gum helps to preserve it and they are having some luck if it's been kept under good conditions and probably in Tasmania conditions are better. Um, they will try and extract DNA. They can also get it from the back of stamps, but you never know who licked the back of the stamp. It could be the post office person. <laughs> um, they are now accepting hair. I don't know whether it has to have follicle, it may have to have a follicle or various other things. It's, they have a, if you look, if you Google them from, from the letter, dot com probably, maybe dot au, I can't remember. Um, they, they will see if they can extract DNA and if they can, they then want to extract the whole genome because it's, they've got to put bits together, it's all fragmented or something and it's actually a very expensive process. But it's, the first step is can we get DNA is less expensive and then you have to pay. If, if they can't get it, then you don't have to pay the rest of it. But. I had to eat lockets from a few of my ancestors. I'm trying to find my grandfather, but no follicles. It's just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's no, I think they have to have follicles. So it, it's, I mean, I think the science will improve as time goes by, but yeah. Stay tuned. Yep. Yes. Uh, I'm Peter. Uh, in July in the ACE, there's a very big article on DNA, particularly in relation to the reference groups that they use. And it's interesting to say that um, Ancestry is using 56,000 odd reference groups. Yes. Uh, and that some of the others are using less, so you get a, a, a broader range of this. Yeah, yes, they've really been working on it. Yeah, uh, it's good to see there's a 12 million users. So there was a little bit of what's known, but for the Aboriginality side of things, it seems they haven't got enough um, uh, reference samples. So that, is there any comment you might have? Um, look, until recently, the only thing you could get was if you had Melanesian ancestry. And that. now they've actually got some Australian Aboriginal reference groups in there. It doesn't, it doesn't go to Tasmanian Aboriginal. And in order to be in a reference group, generally speaking, you've got to have four grandparents from the same group um, or, or geographic location, and probably there's nobody's got four grandparents with pure Tasmanian Aboriginal heritage. And I think also there's been some concern about with some of the Aboriginal groups about using DNA and they don't they don't want to use it or whatever. So it's, that's, and, that's a common in here. It's the 18th of July to look at our button up the age. Yes, yeah, I think there has been some, yeah. Re Ancestry have just updated reference groups. Yeah. They've um, also got into a new thing where they supposedly look at um, which bits of your ethnicity belong to your one parent and which bits belong to the other parent, and then you have to try and work out which is which parent. But, um, and there were, there's more coming out on that. They're working on. They're also looking at bits of ethnicity related to segments of your DNA and all sorts of things. So, watch this space. They have good white papers. My, a lot of the companies, I think Ancestry do, and I know Family Tree DNA, 
white papers explaining how they do all their ethnicity and stuff. So it's worth exploring on their probably their Q and A site or something. They just go digging. There are good white papers there. And of course, prior to 1900, mentions of people in the parish church. Uh, so if they, if they had enough money in the kitty, they attended the church. But of course, sometimes when, a, when the male died, so sometimes a bit of fence jumping occurred. So therefore, you've got children. Mm. On, um, yeah. It says returning from others. Yeah. Oh, there's all sorts of. <coughs> um, I've recently been helping somebody with their DNA and we finally worked it out that he's the illegitimate son of an illegitimate son. <laughs> and the only reason I was able to work out who his father was, was because the first illegitimate son was raised by the grandmother and kept within the family. And um, his birth certificate says who his mother is, but um, he had the family name, and so he's in people's family trees. Yep. And um, and in fact, that was interesting. We couldn't really get anywhere with sort of matching and trying to get some information about him. And then um, the person that I'm working with, instead of just trying to contact DNA matches, she contacted people who had family trees with that person in it. And that's where she hit gold because one of the ones that had a family tree with him in it said, oh, that's my father. <laughs> like, oh, well, yes. And she and her sister that same day bought DNA kits. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're just watching, but I'm fairly confident what we're going to find. But, yeah, if you get two, two illegitimacies, it's <laughs> a challenge. Well, I'm interested, Ross, in where there's like a six uh, testing stations, if you like, and um, there's 12 million users of the uh, ancestry site. Yeah. You've got such a variation across those six, but you did, I agree with you that if you get a lot of American data um, where there's been a lot of testing. Yeah. But uh, in my, my family, I know, we go back to the norms. We came over 1066, not for the install, can't you tell, five foreign, farm, et cetera. Uh, but the other side, of the family, and we know grandparents brought up grandkids and names were changed. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Other sides of the mm. Yeah, there's all sorts of mysteries buried into families. Well, my grandmother lived 105, and she said to my parents when I was 20, she said, Why does Blue want to keep digging up the past? She didn't want us to find the skeletons. <laughs> and we that's did. not did. uncommon, we yeah. Did. It's a bit like the people who, you know, discover they've got convict ancestors and the older family member says, no, 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 of course we didn't. And, you know, we were all free settlers and that's, you know, don't you go digging. And, in fact, I have a family member who used to say to me, I don't know why you want to go digging up the past all the time, you know, and she was just opposed to my doing family history. She has since died. And then a couple of years ago up popped a mystery person in my DNA results. Turns out this particular cousin had a daughter before she was married who she gave up for adoption. And that's and some of the rest of the family did know about it. I didn't, but um, some of her closer family. Um, I'll, I'll yeah, that. and so, yeah, the ones that tell you not to dig, you probably, you probably know the secrets. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just another thing on that. Uh, Story on my side. Um, it was in the days when you couldn't look at convict records because they were locked up and you couldn't mm -hmm. identify your relative. And I was lucky to say, well, what about Jews? It was a sharp. But we saw the remaining great uncle. Oh, no, 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 we want convicts. <coughs> Threw a trailer and put it in front of him. He broke down and said, You're right. Yeah. He didn't want to say anything until I yeah. proved it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we, we love our family history detectives and I think you are our detective hero, Rob. So thank you very much to Rob.